So welcome. Uh, today we will talk about decision making and I'm quite passionate about this topic because um, I feel it's a very important topic in general, even though you may not be doing research on this topic, it affects your life, you know, enormously <laughs> because decisions are being made which relate to your life and your well-being and you are affected by it, whether you want it or not. Um, and also I have a student who is um, doing research in this area. So we have been exploring various models and various uh, scenarios. And it is potentially a great um, research topic for a master thesis as well, right? So you might feel that you will find, may, you may find something that is kind of useful for you. Um, all right, so if you could go to Menti and um, hook yourself up to the, to the system, then we will be able to progress. So let's start with a warm up um, question. So I've asked you to read two papers and obviously the topic that those papers cover is decision making. Uh, it kind of talks a little bit about voting as well. Uh, what is and what is not democracy? Uh, was epistemic, like the second paper uses kind of a fancy word sometimes that make reading of the paper a little bit maybe hard. Uh, what is fairness, uh, quality measures, uh, all the arguments, logic and reality, all right? So what are the concepts you've learned from uh, reading those papers? So what other interesting concepts have been discussed in the papers? Make your choices. What did you find interesting? I don't know how many words it needs to start doing the cloud. Nothing happened so far. <laughs> Maybe there is not enough of us to have this generating the word clouds. Let's see. Yeah, I guess you guys need to do more concepts. Yeah, liquid democracy, challenging limit challenges, limitations. Um, what else? So there was, there was one concept also, oops, sorry. Um, collective intelligence, I haven't listed it here. Have you noticed? Choice, yeah. All right, so one of the papers had a statement which said, uh, theories of social epistemology argue that there are several sources of evidence that laypersons can bring to bear on the evaluation of putative experts themselves. I kind of like that sentence. It sounds kind of fancy and kind of very nice uh, language. What does it mean? What, what that sentence says?
<laughs> so if you were to explain like to a 10 year old, like, you know, what it says in a very simple language, what would you say? So which words you don't understand? <laughs> I can say it in my own words. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Do you agree? So, um, so theorists, okay, that's an easy word. Uh, social epistemology, what's that? Uh, that's the one is a hard one, huh? <laughs> it's a yeah, what it says. The, um, the social, the social yeah. yeah, social knowledge theory. All right, so it's some sort of branch of philosophy or social sciences which talks about how we as society learn. What do we as society know, right? Epistemology usually refers to studying of knowledge, what is known. Uh, what are the limits of knowledge? Uh, how do we gain more knowledge and so on, right? Um, so, so sometimes um, we have uh, uh, kind of pictures like this, which says, okay, those are true facts, right? So there is something true in the world, right? Uh, and then here is like opinions. Of what we think about the world, and then the, the kind of the knowledge is kind of in the intersection. What we think we know, and what actually is true, right? So the epistemology is sort of a study of that of that intersection to some extent. Um, all right, so we have those two, uh, and then it says that there are several sources of evidence. Okay, so that means there are some evidence, some research suggested suggesting that. Lay person, which means everybody, normal people, non-experts, can bring to bear on the evaluation, can actually evaluate uh, who the expert is or how good the expert is without knowing the expert domain knowledge specifically, right? Uh, so it's a very kind of, a, it's a very simple sentence in a sense, but it's kind of um, put very nicely, yeah? Yeah, like the description on another like sample of opinion of views for the sake of being an excuse and like <laughs> why do you need to write this overly complex sentence for the sake of being overly <laughs> complex yeah so what do you think why they wrote it like this yeah <laughs> so yeah, so one positive thing about using language like that, that it is quite precise, right? So if I say, uh, yeah, there are some uh, evidence suggesting that non-expert people can evaluate experts. Um, well, it is, it, it is relatively, communicates a relatively the same meaning, but it's less precise. It's kind of uh, communicates a little bit less in terms of precision, right? Oh, yeah, I don't disagree with that, but I assume that this paper is also kind of aimed at an audience that may be far more familiar with, with all those terms. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But it's like when going back to the last semester where we ended up reading papers where it felt like a lot of people disguised their core sermons and the research, etc. behind complicated words. Yeah. And it kind of gets hard for a more in this to, to use the this sentence uh, wording, it is uh, other lay persons to evaluate the value of the content of the paper, etc., in a clear manner. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of lay persons, I'm just going to be annoying now, will then <laughs> just kind of be also a lot of. Uh, it sounds <laughs> very <laughs> I mean, I think that a lot of people would then just do what I kind of did, and like, yeah, sure, it's probably something smart inside in sentence, and then just kind of gloss over some of the words I don't understand. Yeah. So my point of bringing that sentence here is that uh, towards the end of the year, you will be writing your master thesis, 
And even though you will not be using kind of a very fancy language like this, you should try to use as much precise vocabulary from oh, your yeah. domain yes, as, well. as, yeah, as uh, needed and explain yourself in a way that uh, leaves, uh, makes it and the interpretation easier, right? So from, from, from here, we, we, we have certain um, assertions like the social, the theories of social epistemology. So it precisely narrows down who claims that, right? right. What are the source of the evidence? Uh, and that's kind of a very clever, uh, you know, succinct way of saying, right? If you, if you didn't use those terms, you have to use a paragraph explaining what you mean, right? Um, Do you want to just no, just an example. We, we will come back to that later. All right, so uh, just a quick survey, uh, you know, where we stand. <laughs> have you read both papers? Have you read one? I, you haven't read anything? It's anonymous. You can be honest. <laughs> Why not allowed to select several options? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, my mistake or the tool mistake. Um, um, I probably should have ticked, you know, select one only. Um, what? I can. There's an offer one paper on the first one and the second one on the other one. Right, so uh, all of you answered already? <laughs> so you haven't read the papers? I know, <laughs> you just lost your anonymity set. <laughs> okay, there is a little, yeah, there is a little bit of uh, anonymity. All right, so, um, it's a little bit difficult if you haven't read it to discuss um, the papers. Uh, so what we can do is we can go on with uh, some generic uh, discussion until the break and then you read the, the papers in the break, okay? Um, so I will try to follow up. Yeah, that's that's true. Although last week we said there will be class swapped, right? Yeah. Yeah. Excuses, excuses. <laughs> uh, I will come back to those. Uh, so let's have a bit of a discussion without reading the papers, then, uh, and then you will read the papers, and then we come back to this. So, what is democracy? What do you think? What would be a democratic decision making and non democratic decision making? Yeah. You decide what people say. Okay. You do something forward line, but if you pay the debt, you just decide what's the best. Where to vote. Or we can then also kind of come together and say that we believe that fighters will be voting for us so that we can make themselves. Okay, so if I say you have a choice oh, as a sorry, class, it huh? It was a meant there, but it was a discussion. <laughs> no, we we you, we can talk. Like the online people will have to uh, put text, right? But if you want to talk, then just don't fight, just talk. Um, so that's fine. It is a menti, but it's menti mostly for the online participants. But like this is uh, an open answer question. So if you want to talk, you just you just talk. So if you have uh, two choices, A and B, and I ask you, okay, you have to make a choice and one for you is bad and one for you is good. You don't know quite which one, right? So how, how would be a democratic and non-democratic uh, decision look like? Yeah. So you as a class, you have to choose. So how, how would you do this? How would you democratically choose? Okay. Yeah. So one 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 suggestion is majority. Majority decides. Okay. <laughs> so is it is that fifty one percent decides to kill the other forty nine? Why wasn't the forty nine? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so do we have a, a better model than this? Yeah. That's right. You have to choose A and or B, right? Well, so that's the that's the question also. Like, how would you measure the quality of the decision, and uh, how would you evaluate if the decision was uh, fair and what the decision beneficial, right? But imagine that, um, for example, uh, she has some inside knowledge and she's a minority, she is kind of a single girl in the room, and she knows B is a better choice, right? Uh, if we do majority voting, chances are we can, you know, go 50-50, right? Uh, but let's say you guys want to vote for A and she wants to go for B, but B is the better choice, the mi minority vote would be a better choice, right? So that this would kind of fail, right, in, in that particular scenario. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a little bit different. Yeah. Because lobbying is usually you're trying to uh, wing the decision towards a particular group that would benefit from it. Right? Yeah, it's like if yeah. you start the deal, you know, but you cannot try to sell the whole idea. Okay. So yeah. I feel like also what the best could be taken into account is. Uh, who do does the decision by now affect the If it's a decision that only affects her, for example, why would you need to avoid it? Yeah, you? Um, I would say the majority of our people do need to solve it. Yes. The representative, right? And then the rep makes the decision, right? And then the decision is binding, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let, let's 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 do a different. Uh, well, sometimes different person is the person that might have it from the yeah. Other, so, uh, but that's what you might uh, try to assume, or they try to sell themselves. Yeah. But it's like. Um, <laughs> when I do voting, uh, for example, I'm having a take it like, oh yeah, this guy is talking about, or if I want to like decide something related to say kids or older or whatever, I don't know a bit about that. So I'm just going to assume that the guy I'm voting for might know, <laughs> might know more stuff about that. Like, yeah, that's right. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Just about the end of the all right, so here we have, so those are the models, but here we have like uh, expertise, right? Uh, so some people have a particular expertise and they are more qualified to make a call, make a decision on a particular issue. And some people are less qualified, but everybody has an opinion potentially and everybody potentially is affected, right? Yeah. And that I mean the best example I can think of for now is for example the pandemic. We didn't go around asking the people who could be about pandemic and healthcare and you know, on the international scale before it became relevant. And then suddenly they're involved with lobbying. They weren't involved five years ago. Because no one cared about their second opinion. Mm, yeah, that's true. I don't think a, a, a lot of people care. Oh, yeah, that's different. But you know, yeah. when there's a global pandemic, you are suddenly more involved in the FTC than if it wasn't. I mean, of course, the people in the field of healthcare were always involved, but not in the scale they are now. Yeah, but with the current systems, the the problem is that the experts are not really the ones making decisions. Oh yeah, they're asked about right? their opinion. And, and they're... often the opinions or the arguments of experts are not used, they kind of um, ignored or changed. So the people who are making the decisions are not experts themselves. They ask the experts, but it's kind of indirect, right? So here we have 
this concept of expertise and expert. Um, and you have the concept of generalist uh, who is separate. So most politicians are not actually experts in anything. They are not experts in particular domain. They are generalists which know a lot of people. They know potentially a lot of experts and they know who to ask about a, a decision, but they are not experts themselves, right? So in the normal kind of a democratic system, like in Norway, for example, you have kind of the, the decision, make, decision makers. Decision makers are generalists and they kind of use the experts, but the experts don't have much of a power. They are not voting on decisions. They are just being used by the, by the experts, right? Uh, by the generalists. So, uh, who no, better? I was just going to do that. That's an also the way when you go up to the department level, you have a bunch of generalists, which some people specialize more in certain fields. Yeah. Like, say, agriculture, uh, like you have a few inside the part of that to say, I deal with agriculture, I deal with farming, etc. Yeah. And then you have those, then again, that have internal connections to world of specialists. So you have Specialists, specialists, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so the majority rule, um, the majority rule can be wrong because the minority could be the, the one right. Also, the majority rule can lead to abuse of the minorities because, you know, because you are the majority, you can kind of make the rules and, and laws in such a way that the minority suffers or the minority kind of contributes towards your well-being, but not towards the minority, right? So there, it, there, is, uh, there are some problems with the majority, majority ruling uh, and Normally, what happens is there are various factors being considered. There is kind of a discourse, the discussion. And then usually there is some form of majority rule, right? We don't have a, a better system than majority rule. Yeah? I think that most democracies are like democracy with certain rules that they would have a very general democracy. But we can't really have the majority part where like, we want to kill the poor. And it's like, no, no, we are all trying to agree with the rules wrong. So we have a bunch of laws, et cetera, that we have to kind of uh, overrule them. Like, do, 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 some yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, but, yeah, uh, I mean, there are no problems. There are no problems. But, you know, um, America isn't really a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's whatever. Whatever. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but the problem, of course, is that, yeah, you can have a democracy, but you still have, like, oh, yeah, it's fairly today. Oh, okay, we agree with that. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, no, yeah. So, yeah, the same thing, fine. And then we have also the laws and all that. But we can tell what laws that actually matter. So, the smaller laws, you can just laugh at them. You can leave the smaller laws. You can try to them. But you can go like this. It's like you can see why. So, the situation is the same as the situation. All right, so the democratic kind of uh, process goes back all the way to ancient Greece and so on, right? And normally the democracy was executed in a form of uh, direct voting. So the, you know, um, people sit around, they discuss the issue. And at the end of the discussion, when there was nothing more to say, they basically voted. And then the majority vote was basically considered a policy or considered a law, and then was kind of executed. Uh, with large so societies like countries and large organizations, this form of direct 
sitting together discussing and voting is impractical. Uh, you cannot just say, okay, all Norwegians, let's go to Oslo. There is an issue to discuss and then everybody votes, right? So we normally in uh, democratic countries, we have uh, representatives which we elect and they sit together, discuss and vote, right? But the populace, the, the population is not directly involved. They are kind of represented by whoever they elected to be their representatives, right? So what are the main disadvantages of representative democracy? You wanted to say something before? Uh, in terms of the way it's uh, translated, mainly basically, and also the that's right, they did have slaves and there was a caste system and so on. It wasn't like everybody, right? <laughs> so yeah, it was sort of uh, for that particular level of society, let's yeah. say, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, everyone is allowed to vote. That's just, you know, like you <laughs> Unless you're female and or slave or, you know, for that. So of course it was not as idealistic as, you know, uh, it could have been, but in that, this particular context, it was actually oh. everybody whose decision were affecting them, they were kind of voting, right? Yeah. 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 All right, you wanted to say something? So, what, what, yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, representatives will have bias, of course. Uh, there is a lot of corruption, yes. Uh, corruption twice. <laughs> Uh, they may not be fair to the minority leader. Yes, of course. Uh, what else? What else are the disadvantages? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. So what? Well, that you, you pointed out to one of the uh, bigger uh, problems, which is the package, right? So when you're electing a, a representative, they propose a certain program or certain point of view, and you may agree with half of it, but not with the other half, and then what do you do, right? So if there are two politicians and you agree half with this, half with this, but there is no third option which combines all your opinions, then you have to select sort of a lesser evil, right? Uh, so you cannot be really represented because the perfect match is impossible. Uh, so then you have this sort of a package or policy package problem, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's corruption or misalignment. Like if they promise something, but they do something else, you have this sort of misalignment yeah. of what they actually are doing in on the office and what you have promised when you're voting for them, right? Yeah, it's not quite on It's not necessarily corruption. No, it's, no, it's not yeah. corruption, but if I, if I wait to vote for this uh, party because I promise I didn't do something and then again we get into power and it's like, nah, we cannot even do that. Like, what can I as a then, you know, I voted four, four days ago and I'm not really mad. No, no, I'm that's really right. Go and I can demand them. That's right. So that's another that's another drawback that the system kind of uh, elects those representatives for a certain period of time, and then you cannot change your mind, even though you see they're not doing what you hope they would be doing, right? Um, so what are the positive things of um, representative democracy? Yeah. Uh, I don't need to get involved in some politics and all of it. Yeah. So the individuals, the lay people, <laughs> don't have to be directly involved. Um, also, one advantage is that the, the government is sort of a small number of people and they overlook all the policies. So they hopefully typically have consistency between different policies, right? Um, all right, so. Okay, that's easy. We kind of discussed it every, everywhere. So about you yourself how you make decisions that affect you or affect others? Like how did you make decisions in your bachelor project with your bachelor group? Or how are you gonna make a decision about your master project? What is the process that you go through regarding decision-making for yourself or in your family?
Mm -hmm. So, others? No? Okay, so you're trying to seek expertise, experts? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that's a good one. Yeah, let's let's put it away to majority. Yeah. yeah, weighted majority. Uh do you Google? Do you check what others thought about the, the issue or the problem? How others solved it? What are the pros and cons? Do you do that? Yeah, you do that. So it is like you're not necessarily asking experts, you're kind of asking someone who already experienced similar things or similar dilemmas. Uh, you, as you said, you may have a certain criteria that kind of you developed over time. So from past decision making, you know that if you choose something that is too hard, then usually it doesn't end up too well. So you're choosing something that fits your, you know, skill level or whatever. So you have some set of criteria, uh, which is important, like to develop that over time. Um, so, it, but it's kind of difficult, right? Uh, it, it is a process, and you don't have um, you don't have a fixed way of always doing it the same way. You have kind of evolved your methodology over time to get better at it, right? Um, so that is sort of the the, the crucial thing. Crucial thing. Okay. So, what form of governance do, do you know? Like. Uh, so one is the representative democracy that we kind of discussed. What other forms of governance, you know, from experience or from, you know, films or literature or... Yeah. So monarchy and dictatorship are quite um, quite similar. <laughs> uh, it's just that in monarchy, usually you have some sort of a progression from parents to children with this dictatorship thing. And with the normal dictatorship, you don't necessarily have that. Um, you have, um, yeah. So what, what are the advantages of dictatorship? Yeah. Very effective. <laughs> <laughs> no income, getting stuff done, but there's like, there's no- Exactly. Like, okay, I mean, you do, I mean, I don't want to get into the debate about all the horrid finance and doing about them in a number of years, but they have progressed a lot in many ways. And also, so, you know, yeah, but, but. yeah, of course. So, for the it's advantages for the ones with power, obviously, yeah. but for the for the rest of the people, like for the country, let's say. Uh, yeah. It is a very efficient form of governance. Uh, if the uh, dictator is uh, reasonable and tries to maintain the, the social well-being, it's, it's a very fast, effective way of doing it. The, in, in, yeah? yeah. I mean, like, if you have the dictator, say, the person in China, an average person that comes in has progressed a lot over the last 40 years or whatever, and if all of the Stuff that has been made in the world, it is much 
And then you have North Korea. No. Not much progress. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, I, someone said that if you have the perfect dictator, everything is nice, but everything is just dull. Like, yeah, yeah, this is a well, it can be a well liked dictator. Yeah, I know. So when, when we were kids, we had those stories uh, about the, the bad monarchs and the good ones, the good king, the wise king, making everybody happy and everybody, you know, um, better off and, and so on. Uh, it is a form of a kind of a good uh, dictator, right? Uh, but the problem is that it's very hard to know how to do good for everybody, right? Um, so in terms of a uh, conflict or in terms of war or in terms of like emergency, it's actually very inefficient to do kind of democratic process. It's much better to be kind of a, a very single, you know, uh, single point of decision making. Um, but that kind of creates a very narrow scenario where it's kind of easy to see good and bad decisions, right? Uh, in an open system where there is a lot of uh, groups, a lot of minorities, and a lot of different conflict of interests, then finding the kind of a perfect solution by a single person, that's kind of impossible, right? Um, so that's why that the kind of dictatorship or, or monarchy type of leadership is not really working, even in corporations. So we some, most of the time we do have a kind of a corporational hierarchy where the CEO or the, the top leader is in a, in a way kind of a di dictator for the organization, but they don't necessarily work as a dictator. They kind of work as a board uh, and they manage this sort of in a more democratic fashion, right? Um, ben? Um, it might not be the right question to ask this, but in regards to military and the government, do you most countries kind of have a, if we end up going to war, someone else and they will just take over and and to make everything less clear. Yeah, usually there. countries have that in their constitutions. Yeah. Yes, in the time of uh, some sort of uh, distress, the single person takes over the you know command yeah. of everything, and then it's not the matter of government deciding things. It's just that one single person decides it's stuff. UK, UK can remind that they have a lot of red tape getting the corporate documents that you could see that we didn't come to for them. Yeah. And then what you have a lot of is the Yeah, that's right. All right. So um down to earth, like if you participated or if you participate in open source project, how decisions are made there? Like how what do you know and what do you think? So maybe first, who are the stakeholders in open source projects? Name name the stakeholders. Maintainers, yeah. Who else? Yeah. So you have developers. Maintenance is probably maintainers are probably a subcategory of developers. Who else? Who? Users. Yeah. Users. Works. Investors, yes. Investors, right? Who else? Or does that's it? Kind of covers it, right? Broadly speaking, we have those three categories, right? Uh, in some projects. All three are the same, the same people. Uh, in some projects, those are the same. Uh, in some projects, all are separate, right? Um, so how are decisions made usually? Well, so the developers usually are having some sort of a workflow and they have, uh, they main git or something like this. They have pull requests. They have issues being issued. Uh, users and investors can also issue issues. They say, oh, we want this feature or whatever, right? So this sort of a project management, it's sort of a feedback loop, not only comes from developers and maintainers, but also comes from users. The users say, oh, we would like to have this feature or this doesn't work or whatever, right? So we have some sort of a feedback loop. 
And then the developers kind of adjust to that. Uh, usually you have some uh, mailing list, mailing list where they kind of discuss. Uh, but almost in all successful open source projects, there is usually a dictator, right? There is usually a single person who started the project or who is the one who makes the final decisions. And it kind of follows uh, most of the time that the process is kind of very democratic, right? Very open. Uh, but balancing that, it's that there is uh, usually kind of a right who um, who makes certain decisions kind of commit, but this is a little bit less of a um, um, an open source project you can easily fork, right? You can easily depart. So if the dictator abuses the, the, the role or makes something ineffective for the project, of course, the project, the community can migrate. So the kind of a community and the work driven development is kind of driving the process much more than in a political sense of the dictatorship, right? So those are usually those good monarchs. Those are the ones which actually resolve conflicts and make things kind of actually work. Uh, and that in that particular configuration, it works quite well uh, in, in most of the projects. Yeah. That's right. That, that is true. The, the users don't make, uh, they don't influence directly, but they kind of elect or influence indirectly. Um, in some projects they can, uh, in, especially if they are forks, the users can vote for a particular choice. So they choose to use this instead of that, right? So the community can kind of uh, migrate to a particular solution because of some aspects. And then the users have a, a choice of what they kind of directly vote for by using that particular choice, right? Uh, yep. Which inside the users, etc., can then just tell the main guy that it is wrong and that not so in which it is happening a lot when some open source project sells that. Yeah. So how do we know, like, how is the feedback communicated? We already discussed it, right? So um, the feedback is through those uh, pull requests, mailing lists, and the user migration. So if the project makes bad decisions, the users will leave or the project will fork. If the project is uh, making good decisions, uh, then the user base will grow uh, and the project will become more popular and there'll be, uh, more forks, but not in a form of uh, splitting the community, but more to contribute, right? Uh, there will be more pull requests and the, the project will become more popular. So there is a kind of a mechanism which uh, feeds back to kind of a um, good governance, right? Um, okay, so generalist versus specialist, we discussed that a little bit. So I will skip that for now. Um, all right, so now we're going back to this question of majority voting and weighted voting, right? There was a concept of weight given to some or some one versus others. So do you feel that it's fair to have um, voting which weights somebody's vote more than others? So let's say again, we are in, the, in this class situation. You have to make decisions. Uh, would you feel that it's fair if some of you had more weight than others when casting votes? Yeah. Yeah, so tell me, tell me more. Yeah. And everything 
Yeah. 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 So the the weighting is very crucial, right? Yeah. So it boils down to this weight. So how would you do a weighting that you would feel is fair? Yeah. Yeah, there is a comment which is a very good one. Uh, so the some some people already have more weight because they have the kind of power of influencing the non-experts more than others, right? So there is kind of an implicit weight on uh, some people uh, in the US, mostly celebrities, <laughs> uh, on influencing the the decision making process. But let's let's disregard that. Like, uh, would you feel? Um, so like one way would be based on some features, right? So for example, uh, Lama is alone. She's the only girl here. You have four guys. So we say, okay, you have one vote, she has four, okay? Every time we vote, she has four votes, we just have one. Would that be fair? No, it would not be fair, right? But- like there's some parties that they some Yeah. Some parties, some women, so we are so <laughs> yeah. That's right. So how about this one? Uh, we made some decisions, right? Uh, we made some votes. Uh, let's say we voted on chat 10 times. Uh, and then 10 times it turned out Lama was voting for the good decision, right? It, and we say, well, you know, she was actually 10 out of 10 correct. And you guys were like 50, 50, right? Maybe she should have an extra vote because she's almost always right, right? And then her vote will count more versus your vote, which was kind of 50, 50, right? In the next decision, would you feel that would be fair based on her past performance in, in decision-making to, to give her credit because you said, you don't know if Marius is right about blockchain, but if I was right, like we voted on some stuff 10 times and I will, it turned out I was actually right 10 times. Maybe I am an expert, right? Okay. <laughs> I like it could have been a chance, right? I feel like you have to find out what I can find out. Oh, I've been right all the other times. I've been right the next time. Yeah, playing the long con. Uh, but uh, then you can also refer back to the down and then try to tell the yeah. And then you will have the best answer at the end. But I feel like that is only applicable or once it needs to be applicable to see uh, if, it's a, if it's a bad or good uh, outcome. Or That's right. To your in gray space is that should we ask these guys more? And it's like, no, you can improve in this area, but it won't so really matter. Yeah, that's right. So that, that represents kind of a difficulty on establishing this feedback or establishing this uh, metric of what constitutes uh, a good or, or bad decision, right, in the long term. Uh, even an open source project, when the decision is made, they don't know, like, three months down the road, if that decision was actually good or bad uh, at the time of making the decision. They have to wait to know whether the decision was right or not. Uh, and that kind of uh, leads back to this fairness problem of um, what we consider fair and what um, we consider not fair. So for example, uh, this representative democracy of us electing representatives seems on the surface that it's fair, like everybody has the same rights and everybody is kind of the same, but uh, it kind of turns out that it's not really quite that way, right? Because it separates the 
society into two levels, the ones which don't have the power to decide things and the politicians who have the power of deciding things, right? So is that fair? Maybe, I don't know, right? Um, all right, so let's have a break. Uh, you guys read the papers. Um, it may be hard to read them in 15 minutes. So I suggest you do it um, in such a way that, let me just go to the Git repo. The papers are in the repository and you read very quickly the first one. Um, the second one, I would like you, yeah, so, so skim through this one, read the first half, like skim through it, leave the second half not touched, and then read this one, read the second one more fully, okay? Um, I know. <laughs> All right, so I will stop for uh, 15 minutes, you guys read, and then we come back. And uh, we will kind of carry on with some of the discussions, and I hope you, you read enough that you can uh, contribute a little bit. So what is, so, so first of all, uh, liquid democracy is, so liquid democracy is a form of, uh, delegative. Right, so now we have a term delegative, which is something else than uh, representative. Democracy, and we also have a term direct, right? So the direct democracy and the representative democracy are usually con contrasted, right? So we say the true democratic system would have direct democracy. But for countries, even for a small country like 5 million Norwegians, that's not, that's not going to work, right? That, the direct democracy works for smallish uh, small groups, maybe up to 300 people, right? Okay, maybe 500. Uh, some some govern, governments are kind of uh, they have quite a big uh, hall of representatives. In the paper, they use uh, uh, use this. <laughs> so he said, okay, that many people, right? <laughs> so up to a thousand probably, but that's probably pushing it, right? Uh, so for small number of people, direct democracy, okay, works, and the representative democracy is kind of a converting a five million people into a kind of a smaller subset, which actually is the direct democracy process, right? And then we have this sort of a something in the middle, which is the delegatives, which is different to representatives, but it mixes in the directness. So everybody can vote on anything if they want to, but they can also delegate the vote to somebody else, right? And then you have, uh, you have different, uh, the important thing is that you have those two classes of people. So you have people who vote directly on an issue. So if this is the issue, then they vote directly. And then you have people who delegate their vote uh, to somebody else uh, to then vote on the issue. And then that person has three votes and that person has one, right? Uh, because that's just one vote and that those two delegated the vote to that person and that one has now three, right? Um, so that, that is common. The slight var variation on the schema is, uh, if, so th those people are called uh, like uh, populous, the normal, normal people, uh, and those people are called delegates, right? So the delegate votes on behalf of somebody else's, right? Um, so then there is a question of if I have another person who is a delegate and the other person also got vote from voters, uh, and now can this person give the vote to somebody else, right? And how that works, like how many generations of vote passing can you do, right? Um, so this is an important aspect and we, we will come back to that in, in a moment. 
Uh, so if those people give here, so this one is three grants this one, so that one will end up with six, right? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's right. Yes. So waiting is basically by casting your vote to somebody else. Uh, so it is kind of a model which is in between those two extreme models, right? Um, so what is the problem that liquid democracy is trying to solve? Well, it's trying to solve the, some of the problems which are the problems of the um, direct democracy. So one of them which you highlighted is the inability to vote with this representative for this issue and with this representative for that issue, right? Here you can. You can say about uh, financial policy, I like this guy, he knows what he's talking about, I like his policy program, I want to give my vote to this guy. And for my pension or retirement or for uh, education, I want this guy, right? Uh, because his policy or his uh, plans are aligned with mine, right? So then you can cast your votes for different policy decisions to different people. And at any time you can revoke it, right? Um, so there are some, some um, benefits and some um, factors that contribute to that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that is true, uh, but the um, the parliament sits for the sessions kind of in a fixed kind of intervals, uh, and they decide on certain policies, and then there is an executive kind of uh, process of building stuff and whatever, right? So this is about the, those decision making, like what are the policies, what are the you know the the legal obligations or things that will affect everybody. And then the follow up, follow up is just done without kind of voting anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of related to this uh, process of setting up policies. Um, there was a concept in the second paper about those two. Did you read about this? So who got to that point? It was kind of towards the end. What, what do you think? What, what, what is that? What do you think? So, that's right. So those two terms kind of go to, towards um, uh, diversity, yeah, but it's, it, the term is uh, collective intelligence. Collective intelligence. So there is a bunch of anecdotal evidence, but there is also kind of scientific evidence that if you take experts uh, and you ask them, so for example, uh, one experiment was done with a, a weight of a cow, right? So you take some very expert farmers and uh, I don't know, you, 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 you pick five of them and you ask them, okay, uh, I cannot draw a cow, but... <laughs> Okay, how much weighs this cow? And those five experts will, will say five volts. And then you take the average and then you look at X, right? And then you ask the, the, the people in the audience, the crowd, like, okay, you guys tell me what is the weight of this cow? And those hundred people who are non experts, they never weighted a cow in their life, they tell you the, the weight, you calculate the average, and they give you Y. And Y will always be more accurate than X, right? Um, so the, the, the collective intelligence kind of suggests that um, if you have a very diverse group of people, uh, they will always generate a better answer than if you have a kind of a narrowly specialized group of people, right? Uh, for whatever reasons. 
and also the the count keeps the average low. So like this, um, this kind of an expert average. Um, yeah. I feel like this kind of assumes that uh, like there's no effectiveness like, to find the way that the yeah so for i don't know exactly like people are doing research on this they are kind of uh, studying different experiments and so on the most interesting i've seen was um there was a show uh and a, a person was um they fired up a flight simulator and uh, people in the audience could kind of make a, a decision, like they were voting on what to do. Uh, and then it was average, and then that was kind of being done to the plane. And people who never flew a plane, they could actually land the plane, right, uh, so safely. Uh, so non-experts could actually do something, could achieve collectively something that they had no knowledge about or no skills about. Uh, but because there were so many of them and they were so diverse and they were kind of averaging the, the reactions, it could actually happen, right? Um, so there are various hypotheses why, why it happens. Um, there are, you know, different theories, but the point is that collective intelligence is something that kind of makes sense in some circumstances and can achieve kind of a, uh, an improved decision versus kind of the decision made by the narrow uh, set of people, right? Yep. But I feel like that's kind of still debate in the sense of like the average guy. No, it's not based on the average guy. Actually, the the uh, the thing is that, for example, here, uh, if if these five experts gave the weight of the cow, the the variance like is very narrow. They they don't differ much from each other. It's it's a very narrow range, and those all those numbers are kind of close to the perfect number, but they are not exactly that perfect number, right? Uh, and the and the variance is very small. Whereas with this crowd, guys. The variance is huge. Like some people will say, you know, a ton, and some people will say ten tons, right? It's the like orders of magnitude difference. But the curve kind of narrows down to this perfect number, which actually is the, the, the cow's number. So it's not that everybody is average, it's actually factors in that people are extreme. And those extreme an answers actually factor in the in towards the correct answer, right? Um, so this is kind of one argument for saying that um, liquid democracy is uh, good because uh, it factors in everybody's opinion into the decision-making process, right? With representative democracy, we kind of delegated the decision-making to the, to the subgroup. Not everybody expresses their decision about something, right? But with delegative, or liquid democracy, we kind of uh, overall improve, right? Um, so before, yeah, let, let me go back before you, you guys do this one. Um, let's have a quick. Uh, Okay, so you read those two papers. So which one was easy to read? Easier, or which one you prefer to read? I should say I preferred reading this one versus this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So coming back to our discussion about this kind of a paragraph, the, the kind of a complex paragraph. Um, so the first paper is a little bit, uh, uses simpler language. It's a little bit easier to, for, to read because it is a simpler language, but at the same time, it's a little bit dry. It doesn't have examples. It doesn't have a lot of references. 
it has kind of a placeholder. It's a little bit unfinished. Some some things are a little bit kind of um, a little bit broken. Uh, and the arguments you have to fill in the gaps yourself. Like you kind of need to know. Uh, so if you already know, reading that paper is kind of okay. But if you don't know, then it leaves a lot of holes, right? Whereas the second one is much more consistent. It kind of fills in all the gaps, gives nice examples to demonstrate the point, points all the references. It is using slightly more complex language, but at the same time, I, I felt it's more accurate actually, and it's nicer to read, right? And it is better organized also. It's kind of a very well structured. Um, so, you know, bottom line is try to make your thesis kind of like that, right? Um, not like the, the first one. The first one is, is well cited. It was one of the early work towards the liquid democracy. So it's it's important paper, but you know, quality wise, of course, it's a little bit uh, better with the second one. All right, so then let's go to let's go to the final. Yeah. So is the concept of delegate, delegative or delegate democracy better than representative democracy? One more person. So you don't know, generally, some people think they, they know. So based on that one paper that you read or almost read, is it better? So most, most of you said, I don't know. Now you don't have that option. Now you have to say whether it is or it's not. So yeah. Yes. Yes, you could say that, but do you feel the second paper was biased? Do you think they were strongly for delegative democracy or they were trying to see it from both perspectives and trying to point out the disadvantages as well? I mean, if, if you haven't read all the way to the end, maybe you haven't feel it, but I felt it was quite unbiased. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah, so that that is that question why we don't see it. Like, uh, yes, the Pirate Party are using it. Uh, there are some organizations that use it, but why it hasn't sort of uh, spread, why it hasn't been adopted? Um, what do you think? Yeah. Because it, it obviously has some benefits, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that kind of leads to this um um 
dilemma of short-term versus long-term benefits and also like uh, individual benefits versus kind of a social benefits, right? So there are situations where a majority will kind of uh, have a kind of a greedy algorithm for their own benefit, which actually diminishes the overall system uh, benefit, right? Sometimes you do need to have trade-offs and if you're doing kind of an individualistic decision, you have kind of a problem. So you know the prisoner's dilemma, the, the kind of in decision-making, uh, the, the problem of payoff. Um, so I, I, I don't have time to kind of dive a, a lot into it, but a prisoner's dilemma is kind of a hypothetical situation where if you make a particular decision, uh, you will be kind of better off, no matter what the other person does. But if you both collaborate, then you'll be both better off uh, than if you kind of don't collaborate. So it kind of demonstrates that there are some social circumstances where kind of a collaborative kind of uh, decision is beneficial overall for everybody. But individually, rationally, as you said, you would go for lower taxes, right? Because uh, I mean, that's for me, it's just better, right? Um, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there is one good point, the, the control and power structure also. So the ones who are currently making the decisions and kind of implementing certain decision making processes, they don't want to give up control. And like with democracy is something that voters, the, the, the populace can at any time uh, say, oh yeah, no, I don't like what you're doing. I want now this person to represent me, right? So then you sort of, uh, at least for now, those who win elections for four years, they can do whatever they want, right? There is sort of almost whatever they want. Um, so changing the power structure in society is very complex. Very, very good point, definitely. Um, so um, there is one negative aspect of, of delegative democracy. Uh, there, there are two, uh, which the paper points out. Uh, the one is that if you allow this kind of a delegation to continue, right, uh, you may end up. So if I have, uh, if I have um, five million Norwegians, and we kind of have this delegation, 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 we may end up with a single person making the decision, right? Uh, or we may end up with a small number of people making the decision, right? So it may not be just one person, but let's say there is uh, uh, four people whose votes are kind of are delegated and so all these things, and they kind of have the, the majority of the decision power, right? That's right. And then those, those small number of people can make a mistake, right? Any expert or any person who is in a, in a de 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 decision-making uh, situation, even though they may not be corrupt and may not be all those negative things, they can still make a mistake. But a mistake of that one person affects, you know, uh, millions of voters at the same time, right? Um, when all those five million people vote and they make a mistake, it's one in a million, in five million. Like if one of those people makes a mistake, it's like one in five million, right? But if that person makes a mistake, it's one in four, right? The impact is enormous, right? Those mistakes may not happen often, but when they happen, they will have enormous impact because they completely change the, the, the thing. So there was a, a paper actually, which theoretically analyzed what is the delegation structure which leads to this type of uh, probability uh, distribution. And each person, they, they, of course, they made certain assumptions about like how much of an expert are you? And if you are kind of a more of an expert, then your error rate is much less, right? So if you are like very good expert, 90% of the time you're making correct decisions, right? But you don't have experts which are 100% time correct all the time. Uh, you will always have a certain uh, ratio, right? And then completely uh, newbie person who doesn't know anything about the particular domain, they basically toss a coin, right? So if, if the choice is A or B, they toss a coin and say, okay, A or B, right? And then 50% of the time they are correct and 50% of the time they are not. 
So if you allow this liquid democracy unbounded, then actually everybody voting directly is better than liquid democracy because they will make decisions correctly more often than with the liquid democracy case, right? Uh, but if you restrict how many hops this delegation can happen and how much of the population a single vote, single voter can accumulate, if you cap it, if, if you restrict how much of that can happen, then the liquid democracy outperforms direct uh, voting actually. Uh, if the if the attachment is of course based on uh, on the expertise of the experts, right? Uh, because if the attachment is random, then it doesn't matter. But um, so that's one argument against unbounded uh, liquid democracy because um, you will you would end up with those uh, undesirable side effects. Um, what was the second? What was the second problem with uh, liquid democracy? Which the representative democracy doesn't have that much as a problem. So one was this kind of accumulation of, of, of power, uh, which in the extreme case could lead to dictatorship, right? Uh, because you may have one voter who accumulated majority of the of the vote. Um, so that was one. And what was the second one? So the paper discusses um, some policies like uh, policy A, B, C, and then you have some delegates which kind of got a lot of votes from voters and they are kind of uh, discussing the policies, right? So you end up with, uh, with those people who are kind of uh, uh, generalists, which know to whom give the vote. And then you have the population which kind of uh, passes the vote to them or to experts directly. And then these guys make decisions, right? Uh, but they make decisions within like financial sector or educational sector or whatever. But a normal government, a normal representative government, those are all the same people, right? So they know all the kind of the, the what is being discussed and what is being decided. With liquid democracy, they are different people because an expert in uh, education has nothing to do with financial sector, for example, and they will make decisions which may be conflicting with somebody else's decisions. So this consolidation or this kind of a coordination across different policies is much harder because now those experts which are here making those decisions, they don't necessarily coordinate, like they don't see the same, the same things. So there needs to be some sort of a, you know, structure which makes this actually work in such a way that leads to consistent results. Because if you have, you know, tax uh, or financial ministry doing something which affects education, then, you know, they will be kind of in conflict, right? So they, they, they need to be kind of oversight of what those decisions are being voted on and what is being decided and when kind of a conflict happens when two policies are kind of inconsistent with each other, right? Um, because of course, this is complex. We have very conflicting objectives and we see different kind of positive and negative things on certain policies. So in some circumstances, you would say, uh, given the, the kind of the weight of arguments, I prefer A, but looking at the same problem from a different perspective, you may decide that B is better, right? And then you end up with uh, conflicts. It's, it's, it's not just an experience in the domain, it's more of a kind of a, yeah, the general, yes, oversight of the process itself. Exactly, decentralized coordination. All right, so um, what we did, we sort of read two papers. We learned a little bit of the complexity related to decision making. Uh, and, you know, what sort of projects can happen here? Uh, there is a lot of uh, potential projects. So, one is in, in this area of collective intelligence, uh, one is in the area of improving decision making in open source projects. Uh, to make it even more uh, robust and, uh, and efficient. 
One is in making the system uh, actually to implement um, the sort of liquid democracy like setup for more of a, not necessarily country wide levels, but like for some groups of people that need to decide some things. Uh, even like when you have a group of 10 people and you need to pick a restaurant to which you will go, it's actually really hard to do, right, with 10 people. <laughs> so even for making a decision on that scale, kind of having a system where you can say, okay, I will go wherever Abilate decides, right? I, I'm casting my vote to him, right? I like the same food as he, so he can tell both, right? Um, and then you can kind of uh, play with, the, with some of the objectives. Uh, one is to, that's what we started last year. We, we tried to implement kind of liquid democracy-like system with a blockchain technology uh, because you have some objectives. Like for example, the way you delegate your vote should be hidden. So if I delegate my vote to Abile, nobody should see that, right? Uh, but when he votes, that we need to see where he voted because he's a delegate, right? I need to know for what he voted such that I know whether he represented me correctly or not, whether I want to keep voting for him or not. Uh, so certain things are kind of hidden, but certain things are public. And then this interplay between what is public and what is hidden is kind of an interesting security dilemma of how you organize your uh, protocols and what you expose and what you don't expose, right? Um, so we, we started doing that, but that's turned out to be quite hard, quite hard problem. So we migrated a little bit and we kind of are uh, investigating now this delegation procedure, right? So we, we actually experimenting with this process of checking how many times a given voter actually did correct decision. And then we kind of are promoting that, that those informations are public and then the voters can see, okay, this person uh, was right most of the time. So maybe I cast my vote to that person. And the moment that person makes a wrong decision, then I, I kind of take my, my vote out and kind of cast to somebody else. Uh, and we're also limiting how many cycles like because if I, you know, if this, if I give my vote to Abilay and Abilay give it to Lama and Lama gives her vote to me, then we have a cycle, right? So then this, this group will not vote for anything because we all think we are kind of casting our vote, but there is no delegate actually. And we end up with a deadlock, right? And then detecting the deadlock in this kind of a privacy preserving matter is actually tricky as well, because I don't need to know uh, for whom she voted, but I need to know what was the final decision that has been voted on, right? Um, and so on. So it, it's kind of um, some interesting dilemmas uh, in, in, the, in, in the kind of general space. You raise your hands. <laughs> Not anymore. All right. So um, this is it. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions. We can uh, we can discuss it and narrow down on the in the class as well. So you, I don't expect you to come with a perfect topic straight off. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at least I would like you to narrow down the domain, like uh, yeah. what in what sort of domain you want to work and what type of questions you want to be answering. So we have, uh, like for example, in here, you have a lot of conceptual work and you may be doing some study like the second paper did in terms of kind of uh, analysis of what research has been done and what are the pros and cons of various models, more of on kind of architectural level. Or you might be doing some work like we're doing with actually implementing stuff and doing experiments on like simulation of, of, of society and trying to find out how to make an optimal decision in a particular circumstances, right? And we actually implemented the software and we did some simulations and we calculated some uh, you know, probabilities of the population under those circumstances giving particular result. So I would like you to kind of place yourself, what would you like to do? Would you like to do something more on the theory side or more on a kind of a practical side and what type of research questions you'll be asking? You may have some, example questions or some example uh, thoughts 
but then you can kind of refine it right you can we can discuss it and, and refine it and as i'm saying it doesn't need to be like baked in stone this semester you can kind of uh, refine it until the end of the semester but uh, as as long as you have the domain and kind of a direction where where you're going with this then it's enough yeah so for advanced project work and uh, research project planning you will have to do something towards your masters this course you can explore right so in this course i don't need your project like master project actually as long as you have an idea for a project for this course that interests you and you want to do something with that yeah so that's perfectly reasonable way to do it use your specialization or your electives to kind of explore an area which potentially may be helpful for your masters but doesn't have to oh, be yeah. yeah exactly yeah and then why we discuss with abile and we will kind of plan a little bit more details based on the projects that you will be doing what what kind of lectures we will have and how we will organize the, the semester but we will be meeting twice a week initially uh with the exception of this week where i kind of uh, decided to skip the, the thursday because of the other course yeah what are Say it again. What are first phase courses? Yeah, so we will use it for lectures. Uh, so we, yeah, we will have lectures two times a week for the first half of the semester, and then we will not have it, and then you will have more time working on projects. Yeah. Say it again. Yeah. Yeah, the second one is on Thursdays. Um, on Thursdays from from 12, 12 to two. Same as same as today, but on Thursday. And same. Um, but it's in the A one five four. It's in A building. So will you have the conflict every week or it's only this week? Yeah, you have like a 